set change. All right, all right. My name is Carlton Turner. I'm the executive director of Alternate Roots. Um, for those of you that don't know Alternate Roots, Alternate Roots is a, would you please be quiet while I'm speaking? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, a Adrian. Um, so um, my name is Carlton Turner. I'm the executive director of Alternate Roots. Uh, Alternate Roots, for those of you who don't know, is a 39-year-old art service organization for artists in the South that are doing work at the intersection of arts and activism. Um, really happy to be here. Alternate Roots is one of 14 core partners in the Arts Change Us uh, project, and uh, we're really excited. Uh, the other core partners uh, are, please, core partners, please acknowledge yourself. Hand raise or, yes. So we have a lot of core partners, so please see some of these people if you're interested in understanding more about what their work is, but I think the importance of the core partners is that we're helping to inform uh, the development of this project and its trajectory uh, because much of the, the thesis surrounding why this work is, is important, these organizations have been doing that work for um, the history of their, their time. Uh, so really understanding that these organizations are at the, the foundation and center of this work around understanding diversity, inclusion, equity, um, inequality, all of these pieces are part of our everyday trajectory and our missions of our organizations. Thank you, Carlton. I love Carlton. Uh, and I'm so excited to be here with you. And I'm so excited genuinely from the heart to be here with all of you. Um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the work that you all do. And I say that very genuinely. And I was saying to Roberta on the phone last week about um, the kind of personal learning that I've gone through that I've been able to apply professionally because I get to come to a convening like this. And when I say convening like this, I mean people who are really doing the hard work, who are asking the tough questions, who are really engaging in the important conversations around equity and cultural competencies and you know diversity and all those words that we keep using as we try to find even better words and, and meaning in our lives. So I want to on behalf of the entire team, thank all of you for being here, for leaning into these conversations. And I always say that the work is really hard. I could be the poster child for making the mistakes. Right, Roberta? Yeah, kind of. And in fact, in my previous <laughs> session, I, I did. And so for those of you who may have misunderstood or, you know, my um, imagery and why I was showing it, I apologize on the poster child for not being the most articulate person. But the point is, is that we have to come together and to learn from one another and, um, and be patient with one another. And a forum like this is so valuable. And so I want to say that, Roberta, Wherever you go around the country, I'm going to try to follow as much as possible and to listen in whenever I'm invited into the conversations. And that the Brooklyn Museum will be a home for all of us. And I'm happy to organize events and convenings if it would be useful for folks. Um, and the more that we're together and um, discussing, the better our field will be and the better we will be as individuals. So thank you to Team um, Art Change US and I, uh, or us. And I like to say, change us, pl change me, please. <laughs> OK, so thank you. <laughs> so um, our Change Us At um, is a series of events that will ha be happening. We'll start launching in 2016. Uh, and they'll be all over the country, starting with the 14 core partners. Uh, we also would invite you to contact Roberta or Kristen um, if you're interested in hosting an Art Change Us At event. Uh, it's something that you already have gotten the works. Um, we're not trying to create new infrastructures or create new events, but to tag on and engage and bring more value to work that is already happening and bring more visibility to the work. Uh, we also ask you to go to the Arts and the Changing America website and stay in tune with what's happening, sign up for our newsletter and the information that will be coming forth. Um, and we're on to the next piece. Who gets the mic? Faviana. Hi everyone, so I'm going to try to be a bit creative because I, I know that you all really want to talk to each other and I also know it's been a long day of listening. Um, so why don't we just take a few breaths together and then just uh, we're going to go into a really great session. So if everyone can just close your eyes and just put your feet on the floor and when you breathe in, remember to breathe in with your stomach, and we're going to take three breaths together and really kind of get all our power here together in the room. So ready? One, two, three.
And breathe in into the sky. Just release it into the earth. Thank you. So this next panel um, is about shifting paradigms uh, on race. And you know, one of the things as we were working uh, with, with Ro Roberta and Jeff Chang, um, part of the core team w went to Alaska. And as we've been thinking about this work, we've been thinking and realizing how much we don't know. Right, and really thinking about how do we break away from these binaries, from all binaries, right, including the binary that race is a black and white thing. And how do we highlight the complicated, right, uh, the, the unseen? How do we um, understand what we don't know a lot of and what we, even with our, some of our unconscious bias, tend to ignore? Uh, for example, when we were in Alaska, many of us realized just how much unconsciously we leave out Native peoples from the discussion around race and that we oversimplify uh, race. Um, I have a stat to share here, which is out of the uh, le lead roles in Hollywood, 82% go to white actors, less than 2% to Asian actors, and less than 1% to Native American actors. So we, uh, in, in talking about race, it's also so much about what we don't see and um, the, the complexities. You know, when we, in, in, in every, in our world around us, whiteness is portrayed as the ultimate complicated thing, right? White men can be uh, discovering a planet or flying in outer space or fighting a dragon or falling in love with a computer, or doing anything that humans <laughs> do. And yet the tropes around people of color are so limiting that we even, it, it affects our imagination. So today's conversation, uh, we're gonna start um, with Liz Medicine Crow, who is the president of First Alaskans Institute. And we're gonna talk for about, um, we're gonna try to keep it at about eight minutes and then uh, Jose Antonio Vargas is going to be joining us, uh, then followed by Eleanor Savage uh, from the Jerome Foundation, and then closed by Keith Joseph Atkins, and just have a conversation and inviting all of you to participate. So with that, Liz, do you want to come up and uh, join us? The other thing is we want to, we, 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 we thought it would be really interesting to start uh, this, com two women to be starting uh, this conversation. Uh, so Liz, if you could start by telling us, providing a bit of, of the context. I, I think that maybe not everyone here understands what is the uh, landscape in Alaska. What are some things we should understand about the history of the indigenous people of Alaska? Uh, and then share with us what are some of the models uh, that you all explored and have developed around um, healing. Is it on? Oh, oh yeah, on. there we go. Okay. I don't know why I'm using the mic. Funny. Double mic. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Medicine Crow. I'm uh, Haida and Tlingit from Southeast Alaska, so I'm from here. Um, <clears throat> and on my Tlingit side, I'm a Raven Kutch Udi. Fresh watermark sockeye salmon is my crest on my Haida side. I'm an eagle hummingbird, and I come from the Chichkitne people of Haida Gwaii in British Columbia. And I want to acknowledge my sister, Allison Warden, who's here. I want to acknowledge my um, fellow indigenous men and women who are in the room. I know I saw some folks. Really good to see all of you. And also to thank my hosts, and Faviana and Roberta. It's just been incredible. I felt like um, from the get-go, it was as if someone had designed a, a program just for me. <laughs> 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 Everything everyone is talking about has been just uh, like water to a man in a desert, you know? Um, it's been really wonderful. So Alaska, um, just show of hands, how many people have been to Alaska? Oh, nice, okay. So a lot of you have actually been to my homelands, our homelands, and um, our, our state is very diverse in terms of its indigenous peoples. We have uh, over at least 11 major cultural groups, and there are some distinctions even in there. We have over 21 different Alaska Native languages, which um, through some community organizing and grassroots efforts, our Alaska Native languages were just finally recognized by the state government of Alaska last year, which was pretty, pretty important work. 
Um, Alaska was colonized um, by the United States. A lot of people think it was colonized by the Russians. It was not. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians came in and they fought hard against some of the native people to claim only certain areas. And when they stayed there, they had the permission or they had won that area from that specific indigenous group. They were not colonizers in Alaska. They did not come with their established structures and infrastructures to stay for the long term. They were there for the furs, for the resources, and then they were jamming back home to Russia. So the colonizing force in the United, of Alaska was the United States, and we still live in a very colonial system, very centralized government in Juneau and in Anchorage. Um, there's a huge split between the urban and rural um, communities. Kind of like the race issue, though, it's a little bit of a social construct. Um, and it works to disempower the people who don't live in the urban areas. Um, our, uh, our binary in Alaska is really one of white and Alaska Native. Um, Alaska Native people make up almost 20% of the total population of the state, which is around just over 700,000 people. So we're very small in population. Um, and we have the largest city of Anchorage has the largest population of indigenous peoples in the country in a city with a population <laughs> over 100,000. Um, so the, the enormity of that um, also helps to disempower our native peoples within <coughs> the structure of the city of Anchorage. Um, but we're working on that too, again through a community event, um, through community organizing, and through cross-cultural, intercultural uh, relationships and collaborations, we were able to have the municipality of Anchorage recognize Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October in perpetuity, mm -hmm. just this last Monday. And the state governor, um, Governor Walker, followed um, on the state level to create a proclamation to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand about indigenous people um, in this country, let alone those of us um, in Alaska, there's Annette, <laughs> there's another sister from Alaska, um, is that as native people, we have two different identities um, when it comes to other governments. So we have the relationship as a political entity with the United States. That is not a racial identity. That is one of obligation, treaty, contract, and constitutional law in the United States. The other is the racial identity, the minority status. Um, that one um, in Alaska is usually conflated, and most of the people in Alaska don't know that there is a political identity. So we get a lot of resentment um, and a lot of anger about the so-called entitlements that we get as indigenous people. Um, a simplified way of looking at it for us, really, is it's called rent. <laughs> and you have obligations in your lease um, to live up to. And, um, and really, trying to get to a place of having a more educated population around Native peoples in Alaska has been a real important goal of so many of our organizations and our leadership. Um, so that people can see the contribution that we make, the contribution that we have made for over 10,000 years, and we will make for another 10,000. Uh, right now, Alaska is going through a fiscal crisis. Uh, when there was a poll done by this, I, I can't remember the entity that did it, but they did a poll um, to find out how many people would leave Alaska when um, this fiscal cliff was hit. And about 20% of the respondents said they'd leave. When that number was reported at the Governor's Transition Conference in November, uh, I was sitting at a table with a, a lot of other Alaska Native folks and everyone kind of looked at each other. And Who's leaving? We're not leaving. These are our homelands. And no matter what government sits on top of it, we have a responsibility to steward it on behalf of our ancestors and on behalf of our future ancestors. Um, so the race discourse in Alaska um, is one that's convoluted and complex because of the political status, um, also because of the racial status. But we also have a huge population of immigrants, um, starting with the Russians, <laughs> followed by <laughs> all the other explorers, and then all the other communities that have come in. 
Um, and I think that that's really interesting. As an indigenous person, this might be something that we share in common, is that if you're not indigenous, you're all immigrants. And, and that is, that's a great thing in this country. Um, one of our leaders uh, at the Alaska Federation of Natives said, and she coined the term, I'm a first American for new Americans. And I think that that's something that people could really learn a lot from. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do in the, in, the, in, in the conversation around racial equity in Alaska has been applying our, our cultural ways of being and knowing as a tool for changing how people approach the conversation. Uh, in Alaska, when an incident occurred, a racial incident occurred, it, what would happen is there'd be an escalation. Um, there would be uh, the people who were harmed, usually uh, people of color, Alaska Native, black, um, maybe Pacific Islander. We have a huge population of Pacific Islanders. Um, and then there'd be this um, kind of backlash uh, from the non-native community or the white community. And, um, and it would just get really angry um, and heated. And something would occur. Maybe they decided to take a vacation for two weeks or something. And then, um, and then they'd come back and it would just kind of die down. Well, we did uh, a 50th anniversary discussion series around the state of Alaska, um, asking Alaska Natives what their perspectives were on statehood. Obviously, we didn't use the term celebration in that, because that would um, maybe not reflect everyone's perspective. And what we heard on when we traveled around the state was that <coughs> people were still really um, fighting discrimination. And, um, and we're really concerned about it. So we created a project based on our native values um, that created a space for healing um, and using kind of uh, the principle, don't teach me about my culture, use my culture to teach me. Mm -hmm. And um, using that as a framework for building a place, a safe space for people to come and actually have real conversations about their experiences with race and racism. Um, and also making sure to say, if you haven't had an experience with racism, that's also an experience. Um, and that project that evolved out of that is called Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity, um, now and or. Um, and we have trained host um, young people, usually between the ages of 20 and 40, who host conversations about racism within their communities, whatever community they define it, whether it's a geographic location, a cultural community, religious community, an interest area or a lifestyle community like photographers um, or um, hunters, for instance, uh, so that they can start advancing those conversations from a place of um, humanity and relationships rather than transactions. Great, thank you. And I, I wanted to um, also just make a comment, Liz, because you were you mentioned that um, uh, that anyone who uh, was not indigenous to this land, was an immigrant, and I just wanted to add, there was forced, people forced also here against their will, and I want to acknowledge that because that is not, that wasn't a form of migration, that was a form of, of terrorism against people of the African continent, so I mm. want to just um, honor that. Uh, next is going to, uh, Jose Antonio Vargas is going to join us, and he is the creator of the um, show, uh, the piece on MTV, Whiteness. White people, white people. <laughs> my very, my, my, my great friend Jose. And Jose is gonna be showing us a clip. The trailer. The trailer. people are getting antsy. So it's only a minute. Yes, and then we're gonna the talk. The clip was like seven minutes. So. We're gonna talk about uh, white people. Yes. <laughs> So we're doing a film for MTV on what it means to be young and white. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you say the wrong thing, then suddenly you are a racist. <laughs> I'm trying to be careful here. I don't want to offend people. I feel like you guys are attacking me now. If I bring up any sort of race issue with my parents, they immediately assume that I'm demonizing them. Can you help? Can you help? 
How might your life be different if you weren't white? When you say white, what does that mean to you? We've never had to internalize what white people have done in America, but here, you can't escape that. It feels like I'm being discriminated against. You kind of get this feeling that things belong to you. I'm getting uncomfortable. It's, it's uncomfortable. Hey, this is great. Let's get all uncomfortable together. <laughs> oh, should I be sitting on this chair? Yes. Uh, I, I remember when this uh, when the trailer when came the trailer out. came out. A lot of people were saying, "I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see why people cry. Who cares?" And they call I'm it just, like mayonnaise. Yeah, like, there was so all these memes <laughs> on Twitter about like white crying is like mayonnaise. I didn't white tears. <laughs> so why do you think? Tell us a little bit about why, <laughs> why, why, why did you think? Why is it important to talk about whiteness? And what's yeah. what was something that really was kind of some learning moments when you were making this piece? Um, first of all, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, second, I just want, I am so, this is probably like one of the best days of my life to be in a room like this. Um, and to have Roberta Uno's vision like just manifest. So can we just like give her a round of applause? I don't know. I just, um, so. <laughs> I'm um I'm a journalist and filmmaker. Before I outed myself as undocumented, I was a journalist and filmmaker. And since they haven't deported me, I'm still a journalist and filmmaker here. Um, that this film was a partnership between MTV and Define American. Uh, MTV funded the whole thing, thankfully, because if I had waited for foundation grants, it would have taken a decade. <laughs> um, just kidding. Uh, uh, <laughs> so MTV funded the film um, because what happened was I had made another film for CNN called Documented, uh, what it means to be an undocumented immigrant in America, and then the MTV president saw it and said, hey, like, did you want to do make a film about white privilege? I'm like, absolutely. Um, but at Define American, you know, we use all forms of media to change the culture about immigration. So at Define American, we've done 470 events in 48 states in 210 college campuses in the past four and a half years. Mm. So I'm really tired, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> but what we've really realized is until, <laughs> until we can get white Americans to understand that you know white is not a country, like where did you come from, how did you get here, who paid? If you can't answer, I know every immigrant can answer that question. Every black American can answer that question. Native Americans can be like, wait, what are y'all doing here? You know, like. How do we create a space for white, especially young white people, to have a conversation about this? So MTV commissioned a study that inspired this, and I think I shared it with Fabiana once. So check out these really interesting statistics. Four out of five millennials, you know, apparently we're supposed to be the inclusive generation. Four out of five of us are uncomfortable talking about race. <laughs> Nearly 50% of white millennials feel that they're as much a victim of racism as people of color. Mm. Let that sink in. So one of the scenes is actually a woman in Arizona, a young white woman who feels that she couldn't get a college scholarship because it's all going to the Mexicans and the Chinese. Which, by the way, was a very prevalent opinion among many young white yeah. people, Republican, Democrat, whatever, whether we were in South Dakota or we were in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. right? And the last thing I thought was really, really interesting, given the demographic change, 90% of white people only have white friends, and three-fourths of them live in predominantly white towns. Mm -hmm. So the desegregation that we're talking about is very real. So as an immigrant, we always get asked where we're from. So I think now is the time, especially the, you know, this is, when we made this documentary, which aired in July, by the way, it's free on YouTube. It's been really wonderful that MTV made it for free and then Define American worked with MTV to create a curriculum. So many high school teachers oh. and uh, college professors are yeah. using it, right? Mm -hmm. As a way uh. to talk about not only race, but immigration, because we can't right. separate the two. I think mm -hmm. that is, we have an opportunity right now with Black Lives Matter, you know, with immigrant rights, with LGBT rights, with women's rights, to really look at intersectionality beyond an abstract theoretical thesis statement. Like, how do we put that into practice mm -hmm. without banging people's head with it? And I have to tell you this, and Fabiana knows this, because when we announced that we were working on this, you know, thank God 
you know, you have a friend like Fabiana for me, because as an artist, like, you really have to stay on your ground, right? Because people were like, what are you doing? Like, why don't you, I had so many <laughs> interesting emails from other people who color filmmakers who were like, why don't you make another film on immigration? Like, you know, you should do a film on incarceration rates or the detention centers. Like, white people don't need any more films about them. And I'm like, well, that's not really what I'm doing. Like, you know, white is a construction, right? I mean, didn't everybody read Toni Morrison and James Baldwin? Like, didn't we, like, you know, like, how are we? And until one of the, I'm really proud, the film is only 43 minutes long. It's not that long, right? We stop at um, Pine Ridge, um, a high school at Pine Ridge. I could not have made this film without including the Native American story in there. Um, we have a white, gay, young man who uh, chose to attend a historically black college. And then we ended this, the, the film with Bensonhurst, with, a, you know, it used to be a predominantly Italian town that is now becoming more Asian, specifically Chinese, right? So it's a way to kind of, again, intersectionality without like banging peoples in the head with it, right? Um, but yeah, so that's why we Great. made the film. Thank you, I, I, and I just want to say also thank you for your courage in like actually as a man of color, queer, undocumented man, being the one to say yes, I'm gonna be the one to dismantle whiteness because white people do it for us. All they tell our narratives all the time, and that you actually feel that this is an important thing to take on despite all the the criticism that came at you. And and and, and the larger conversation is I was just in Iowa last week, mm -hmm. and I said something that I usually don't say in front of too many people. I got asked this question a few months ago in DC at a small little panel. You know when they have those race panels in DC? Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm not gonna name which one. So they asked me what was at stake in the election? And I said, you know, what's at stake in the election is, you know, like the country is only gonna get gayer, blacker, browner, more Asian. Women will break every possible barrier they must and should break. So what's really at stake is the soul of heterosexual white men. <laughs> and how do we have this conversation in the most inclusive way possible? You know, I don't, you know, I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm not here to shame you. I'm just asking you questions that you're asking me. Mm -hmm. What was your papers, right? How did you get here? What law did you have to get? You know, all I'm trying to do is ask the questions and the institutions that you've created for us, turn it around and say, wait up a second, have you actually thought about this? Yeah. And, but I said that statement in Iowa, at Iowa State University in Ames, in front of like 700 students, and I've gotten so many interesting emails from straight white male students. I might make a film out of it. It's really interesting, <laughs> because the internalized kind of guilt and like, you know, I'm not here for that. I'm just trying to tell you that until you can see me, I can't see you, right? Yeah. And you know, I thought, uh, Darren's statement about we have to create economies of empathy. So how do, now we really are in this unprecedented moment in this country in which people feel like they're the other. You know, I can't talk about white privilege to like white people in a trailer park in Little Rock, Arkansas. They're looking at me, they're going like, you know, you're taking away what was ours. And then you have Barack Obama, you have Michelle, you have JC and Beyonce and JLo and all these Asian people at colleges. Like they feel like the future got taken away from them. So how do we create a space to have that conversation. You know, besides Bernie Sanders and Donald and Donald Trump, who's talking to the white working class in this mm -hmm. country? So that's why we made white people. And we'll be making more. Yes. Great. Thank you, Jose. <laughs> Next up, we're gonna keep it moving. We're gonna keep it moving. Next up we have Eleanor Savage, program officer at the Jerome Foundation. Yeah. And Eleanor is working um, w in the Grant Makers for the Arts on the racial equity, the racial justice, I, I forgot the name of the, it's the ra Racial Equity Forum. Racial That's Equity Forum, we, and yeah. you could share your thoughts with us. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm the white person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, Congratulations. So, I feel really, um, <laughs> all joking aside, I feel really honored to be invited to be on the stage with you and to be part of this. Thank you, Roberta. Um, so when uh, I was asked, how do we shift the paradigm from diversity and inclusion uh, to equity and desegregation and transformation, 
uh, what my truth, what sat, sits with me as my truth is that we're not even in the um, paradigm of diversity, much less, you know, able to shift it to equity. Um, what I experience on a daily basis is the paradigm of racism and uh, segregation and exclusion uh, of people of color. And so I, <coughs> I thought I would uh, do a deep dive into some of the uh, comments. My list won't be as funny as Hari's. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm going to share with you now um, some examples of things that I hear and uh, cohorts in the funding world hear on a daily basis um, that come from uh, uh, direct racism. Okay, we can just run through these. What am I supposed to tell the white artist who won't get funding? Because you're imposing a quota requiring that we fund artists of color. We sent the grant event job announcement to all of our mailing lists. If they don't apply, how are we supposed to get more people of color? Yeah, you can respond to this. Oh. This needs to, I don't know how, I don't have time to give individualized help to grantees that don't know how to prepare applications, can't work with our online grant system, and can't get it together. We are open to everyone. There just aren't any qualified black, yeah. native, Latino, Arab, or Asian <laughs> artists staff, board members in this community. Uh, what do I mash? I'll catch you up. Sure, yeah. Up. Thanks. Um, our priority is not diversity, it's artistic merit. We don't believe we should sacrifice quality. We don't have a problem with racism, we are colorblind. Bringing up racial issues is divisive and unnecessary. Telling people their behavior is racist is mean. <laughs> We're an arts organization, not an activist organization. We don't have enough time to do everything we're already doing. I'm editing out your references to race and diversity in this board memo because it will upset the directors. How do we even know that people of color aren't being supported? Where's the research to prove it? <laughs> I've got a lot to learn before dealing with racism. I don't know how to do this. If we do something wrong, we'll be worse off than if we don't do anything at all. So <sighs> let's look at the messaging in these comments. Uh, in order to have diversity or equity, something has to be sacrificed. Space for white people, artistic quality, organizational focus. There's no proof that inequity exists for people of color. It's too hard to find people of color. Including a people of color equals excluding white people. The effort to include people of color costs extra time and money. And racism doesn't exist, so we don't need to work on it. Wow. So the notion that we're in, in a post-racial society is a fallacy. Um, we need to stop acting from places of fear, passivity, apathy, complacence, discomfort, and resistance to and denial of the reality of racism. I'm gonna say that again. We need to stop acting from places of fear, passivity, apathy, complacence, discomfort, and resistance to and denial of the reality of racism. These behaviors are as much a part of the paradigm of racism as overt violence. Yep. We need to acknowledge that racism exists and we need to take a stand against it. We have to face the fact that denial and resistance are, <coughs> I'm repeating myself now, as much a part of racism as overt violence. We have to learn how to interpret, interrupt it, challenge it, be in conversation about it, act against it, and change the systems that perpetuate it. And for white people who define as anti-racist, we can't position ourselves as separate from covertly and overtly racist people. We have to be responsible and accountable for shifting the paradigm of racism. We have to create space for anti-racist learning that is not punitive. And for the last couple of years, I've been asking people, where do you see racial equity happening? And there's usually a long silence, and there are a few answers in response to this. We, have, we need to have a vision for what we're moving toward, not just what we're working against. And artists have much to offer in helping create this vision. And so to the question of, and I have one more slide, 
of how do we move from the r this racist paradigm? We have to admit that this, that systemic racism racism is a reality. We have to stop perpetuating racism and do things differently. Mm -hmm. Learn the early warning signs of whatever your avoidant behavior is, and and start taking action against maintaining the status quo. <coughs> um, learn how to interrupt racism, how to practice anti-racism and practice anti-racism with the same reckless abandon that we practice and participate in racism. <laughs> Envision and imagine what racial equity is and adopt racial equity as a value and implement clear goals for living it. I want to challenge my fellow white people to take immediate action on racial equity and by racial equity I mean an end to systemic racism, and by systemic racism, I mean an end to the daily dehumanizing and destructive attacks against people of color. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our, our next and final guest, and then we're going to open it up to questions and a conversation, is Keith Joseph Atkins playwright, screenwriter, and co-founder of the new Black Fest. Woo. Welcome. Woo. Thank you. We were tweeting earlier. We were doing <laughs> <laughs> We retweet each other. Ah, OK. <laughs> Great. Um, so tell us about, in, in, on, on your website, you talk about this, you know, the, the, the urgency and, and the moment of, of why um, the new Black Fest is important. Tell us about your work. Definitely. Um, well, about five years ago, I, I was living in Los Angeles. I was working in TV. And I decided to come back to New York City because I felt like New York was probably better to keep my brain hard. Um, and I was feeling a little softened in LA. I love <laughs> LA, but I just felt like my brain was going to. <laughs> um, I had so much more things to think about. Um, so I came back to New York City and got right back into the theater community, which I was a part of. And for me, um, many of my peers were complaining about the same issues around the type of complex roles that they were be auditioning for, the type of plays that um, were being produced, particularly August Wilson, who I absolutely love August Wilson, um, brilliant, brilliant craftsman. But that type of play was continually to be produced, and mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of variety. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided to do something on my own, which was to start my own theater organization, to at least begin having small groups get together and just sort of read each other's work and even more importantly, sort of qualify each other because I felt like what was happening within the black and brown communities within New York City theater communities that many of us and were waiting for the white institutions to qualify our careers mm -hmm. and to qualify whether or not we were good, whether or not we were urgent, whether or not we were important. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like, let me try to do something to sort of help us qualify each other. And um, so the interesting thing, um, uh, at around that time, um, Arena Stage was housing, I think it was a New American <laughs> Theater Institute. Um, David Down, Down was Down running that. Down. Yes, Down. thank you. Um, and so they had this uh, black playwrights convening. Uh, they invited 40 playwrights. I was not one who was invited. Um, but another playwright, Robert O'Hara, was invited and, and sort of snuck me in the back door. He said, I really think you need to be down here to have this conversation mm -hmm. about what's happening in the black theater community. Um, so I got there, and everyone was just talking about all the sort of um, inequities, um, the lack of complexity, lack, the lack of authenticity, um, white sort of storytelling with black content, um, all these sort of things have been going on for years and years and years. And so um, the final sort of question that was posed to the audience was, or the participants was, um, what's next? Now that you know these issues are here, what are you going to do now? And I sort of raised my hand. No one else did. I was the only one not invited. Um, I was like, yeah. And, um, and David was like, yes. And I said, I think I want to start my own theater company, our organization. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know who's going to be involved, but I want to do that. And immediately, two other people, Jason Holtham and Jocelyn Prince, who are two other three theater practitioners, came up to me and said, I we'll do anything we can to help make this happen. Lynn Nottage, who was also there, came up to me and said, hey, maybe I can help you do a fundraiser in my backyard in Brooklyn, which is what happened. Um, so maybe three or four months later, we kicked off our, our first um, event. Um, the new Black Fest, we were at um, Brick before they got that $30 million re restoration. Um, so it was like the black box space. It was awesome. It was awesome. I basically collected six or seven playwrights, um, most of them from New York, a couple of them from Chicago, one from 
um, London and one from um, Kampala, Uganda. Mm -hmm. And, um, and my, my mission was to bring all these voices together and all these storytellers together, not just to sort of represent blackness, but to represent the diversity mm -hmm. and the complexity within the black experience. And not just for white audiences to consume, but even for black practitioners and audiences to learn about the complexity that exists mm -hmm. amongst each other, because mm -hmm. I feel often we subscribe to this one narrative that the white institution is sort of creating and sort of stirring, and does, and we don't even challenge ourselves about whether or not that's real for us, or even if it, are, if it is our story. Um, so now I'm in my fifth year of the organization. Um, a couple of years ago, right after the Trayvon Martin and Zimmerman verdict, um, I commissioned five playwrights, um, uh, actually six playwrights to write from diverse demographics, uh, Palestinian, um, Lebanese, uh, Filipino, uh, white American, two black Americans, to write about Trayvon and privilege and our race. Um, and that's been done throughout the country. The following year, when Ferguson happened, I then commissioned six black male playwrights to write plays in response to Ferguson and all that was happening in the country around black male policing and, um, and institutional um, horror, terrorism. Um, and that's been done throughout the country. Um, and also, let me just go back, Facing Our Truth, which is the first piece that I commissioned, is now being, now published by Samuel French, which I'm so happy about. Took all the administrative work out of my hands. <laughs> um, and, uh, and more recently, so after the Ferguson event, which I called Hands Up, Six Playwrights, Six Testaments, mm -hmm. um, we, ha we kicked off at CUNY Graduate Center, uh, Martin Siegel Theater there, and a black pl actress walked up to me and said, this is really amazing. You're speaking and having these black men talk about themselves, but uh, what about us? You know, or what are you doing about giving voice to black women in this capacity? So I then commissioned five black oh, wow. women playwrights um, with the collaboration of Dominique Mariso, who's a playwright as well, and we called it Untamed Hair Body Attitude Short Plays by Black Women, which we just kicked off this past Monday at the CUNY Graduate oh, Center. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm about yes. theater, I'm about complexity, authenticity, and for us to learn about each, each other's complexity. And I have a, yeah. a follow-up question for you because I, I I know that you know today we've been even, even hearing the idea of, of pop culture, and I, I I I don't necessarily believe that there's a binary where there's pop culture and then there's the arts, but I think something to think about, and you just stated this, is that in the in in most of the institutions that control and disseminate pop culture, white power is ingrained, it's solidified, yeah. and often we have to play by their rules, whereas in much of what you all are doing, you are building infrastructure and institutions and really having power. And although it may be considered the margins, nevertheless, the approach is very much on your terms, on our terms. Um, so talk about that, about what, what is this thing that you negotiate when you make the choice of really investing and creating something um, it, it, that be precisely because there is not space in these places where power is so solidified mm -hmm. and 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 um, where and 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 how is that uh, effective and other folks can answer as well yeah, I'll just start and say I mean for me like I'm from southern Ohio um, my family was historically a African Methodist Episcopal so they have been social justice advocates since the late 1700s as free people of color um, my mom's family is also Catholic my dad's family's from Georgia and they were Baptist um, both of my grandparents were part of the civil rights movement. My grandmother, one grandmother was a domestic, the other grandmother was a school teacher. So I grew up in, an, in a very empowered community and home that was complex. So when I came into the world of theater and storytelling, I, my expectation was the complexity would be embraced. It would be the national sort of just the institutional conversation. And I was surprised to see that it was not, and I was very disheartened by it. So for me, just because I come from this place of empowerment and complexity, I wanted to continue on that legacy and challenge anyone I was working with to also invest and support that. So for me, like, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm just, I, I have, I just, it's, it's sort of, I'm hardwired that way. I just mm -hmm. feel like it's important, so. Let me just add about, so I just moved to LA. I think my brain cells are still okay. <laughs> give, it five years. <laughs> uh, give it five years. Give it five years. Because the Fine American is opening kind of a Hollywood entertainment section and like right. kind of a, an office to, in the same way that the LGBT community really use television, you know, in movies mm -hmm. to have representation, right? Yeah. Immigrants need to do the same thing. So the Fine American is opening a sector just for that. But it's been interesting. I'm about hopefully to become a member of the Screenwriters Guild. 
they don't let undocumented people in, so we're trying to figure out how to make that happen. But it's been really interesting because you know they only let a couple of us in, hmm. meaning it is a crisis. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at the you look at the studios, even you just look at the documentary units. Who gets to tell the story? Who gets to produce it? Who gets to direct? Like, like for white people, I was just really lucky that the president of MTV loved my film and gave me, you know, last edit, right? Like, I was like, this is my film. I'm gonna give last edit. I have creative control. For the most part, that doesn't happen. They give you the money, then you know, they allow you to do your thing, and then it gets back, and then you know, they do it, right? Like, I mean, I hate to say this, but like, until we get to really own, you know, our own media institutions and our own structure. Um, it's gonna be really hard. I, I don't have any. I don't. I don't think you know. Not. The, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time explaining. <laughs> you know, trying to like. Oh, you know. I, so that gets really tough, and I don't know what support is out there. Yeah. Um, you know, especially by the way, what I find as a journalist and filmmaker, like the the um, the blurring of the lines between you know journalism and podcasting and video, all of that is kind of ending up into this digital space, right? Like we're creating an entire new media infrastructure. You know what's really, really tragic? It mirrors the infrastructure that it's trying to replace. Yes. Mm-hmm. Newsrooms, yes. when I started yeah. when I was 17, I'm almost be 35. Newsrooms are less diverse now than when I started in journalism. You know, that is journalistically criminal. Yeah. So how do we invest on that, right? And not just to perpetuate, I love the New York Times, it's always gonna be there, all news fits the print, but I'm sorry, Black Lives Matter did not start in the New York Times, nope. right? So I, I just have to really push us in terms of thinking about how to fund these things. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. Uh, just throw your hands up, we could do a little popcorn style, we'll ha- pass the mic around. Looks like we have a question. Of Yes, here in the back. Oh, here you go. <coughs> Hello. Um, oh. <laughs> Hello again. Um, Liz, you mentioned that in your new program um, you're doing racial reconciliation and I'm wonder- with using Native values, and I'm wondering what some of those are and how you've applied them in this way. So, um, <coughs> One of the things that um, I grew up with, uh, and I think a lot of our Native people in Alaska grew up with, is going to fish camp, um, working on our food, preparing, um, harvesting, gathering, hunting, and fishing. And it's it's hard work. It's all hands on deck. Everyone has a role. It's intergenerational. Um, And and it's about an outcome. Um, And you're preparing for it all year long. Um, significant to that process is a smokehouse, uh, a fire, and one of the best memories that I have growing up is sitting around a fire, and it was around the fire or around the table uh, at my grandparents' house where really hard conversations happened, um, and using kind of this idea um, of how our elders interact with each other. Um, there's a way of disagreeing that looks like agreeing. Um, And it's a supportive process. Uh, It's a, you're saying something, and I hear you, and I may not not agree with you, but instead of saying, and it having to be adversarial, it's rather an acceptance that this is your, this is your truth. And so my grandparents sitting around the table with other elders talking about really hard issues in our community, trying to make a decision as the leadership how to deal with it. Um, They had different opinions about how that should happen, and they would listen to each other and they would say, "Uh uh-huh, 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 I hear you, I hear you, And, uh, and this is how I feel about it. And it wasn't adversarial, it wasn't like you had to prove a point. Um, It created a space for people to actually really connect. And so we built a series of agreements in our dialogue process as a healing dialogue process that also has a component of amplification of power, of self-determination and self-governance by giving people the, um, 
rec the opportunity to recognize they don't need anyone's permission to do what's right. They don't need to be told or asked to do what they know they have an inherent ancestral duty to do. And so these agreements are structured to really elevate what are shared native values. And here's the big secret, they're human values. Mm -hmm. So the first one is in every chair a leader. Uh, we also say speak to be understood, listen to understand. So you're not in a position of just waiting for your turn to talk. Um, that the greatest learning is when your mouth is shut. Um, and if um, I, the way that we phrase it is it's an and conversation, not an or conversation. So it's additive. Um, and like I said earlier, it's about relationships and how you treat one another. Um, that you could be the biggest flaming racist ever, but I will still sit across from you and try to listen. And it, in the process of bringing that humanity into the room, you have an opportunity to change a heart. And when you change the heart, the mind will, the mind will follow. These are things that our grandparents have taught us for thousands of years. So that's how we've tried to construct the dialogue process. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, so it's been said uh, throughout this process that people of color will or they already make up majority of the population of the United States. And as we see a lot of times, you may have, it's divisive sometimes, we have Latinos, uh, people of African diaspora, natives, and a lot of times we don't discuss how we can help each other as people of color, how we can be allies for one another, uh, um, and, I, and I wanted to know if you can offer that to us of how can we as people of color be helpful to all of your movements. I could share a little bit about what Culture Strike is doing right now, and we're working on um, a project around working within the immigrant rights movement around the anti-blackness that exists. And so, for example, the immigrant rights movement would say things like, we're not criminals, we're here to work, which is this whole productivity lens that actually has been exploiting people for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of centuries, is seeing people just by how good they work. So um, I think that that's a great example of how even within our peers, we're saying, hey, you know what? Like, when you say things like, mejorar la raza, you know, there's a saying in Spanish that says you gotta improve the race. That's anti-black, and we have, mm. to, uh, it, we have to stand uh, with the black liberation movement because we are connected. You know, what you said is that actually shaming doesn't change people. Shaming, like, isolates and excludes people, whereas, compassion and actually saying, okay, let's create spaces to talk about this and how anti-blackness is actually woven into a lot of strategies without us even, you know, Eleanor, you said it. It's so, it's so deep that you have to undo it. That's one way is within our communities too. I have to say, by the way, like that's for me has been one of the most optimistic things about the Dreamer movement yeah. um, is how incredibly inclusive and mm -hmm. intersectional it is, right? Um, I hope somebody's doing like a big study on this because I'd want to know how it happened. <laughs> like, it's not an accident, right? Like, it's not an, it's not an accident. It, ha it happened this way. Yeah. And, you know, people don't even know that most of the leaders of the, un of the undocumented youth movement are LGBTQ, right? Um, somewhere up there, Harvey Milk, you know, is like smiling. Um, <laughs> and so many of the LGBT dreamers who are leaders are women. Right, so that's yeah. really, really interesting. Yep. Um, I have to say one thing to add to this, Fabiana, and we talked about this in a little breakout session. I think the need, now, let's not assume that all Latinos and all Asian, <coughs> Asians in this country, um, you know, share, like, you know, are advocating for black liberation, right? Like, what kind of work needs to happen within our own communities? Right. Yes. You know, exactly. I mean, I love my family, but some of the most racist people I know are my cousins. Yes. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, who are like. That's real. And uh, you, know what's get, you know what's getting really dangerous in California right now is the whole affirmative action conversation and how the Asian as the mi model minority myth and Nick Kristoff, bless his heart, you know, writing columns about Asians is an exception as if we're like, that is so dangerous and pernicious. Mm -hmm. You know, like I am not your model minority. Like I declare independence from that. And I don't want to be used as a wedge so that you can say, oh, I don't understand why the Mexicans can't be as studious as the Asians. 
right? Like, so what kind of work needs to happen within the Asian community so we don't fall into that trap and we don't get used in that way? I don't know what kind of work is happening that way. Do you know, Fabiana? Well, I, I mean, earlier today, Beatriz was talking about oh, complexity. Yeah. I, th oh, I think somebody was going to mention something here. Yeah, go for it. Aloha, <laughs> Kako. I think we're already doing it in our own little way. So oh, great. Mm -hmm. um, Carlton Turner from Alternate Roots, First People's Fund, Lori Poirier, Maria Delian, from Nalak and myself, Vicky Takamini from Pa'i Foundation, the little Hawaiian organization that gets to hang out with these three fabulous, wonderful people, have started an intercultural leadership institute. Awesome. Wow. Because, awesome. where's Roberta? She's convened us numerous times, and we've naturally gravitated to each other because of the work we're doing. I've learned so much. I think I'm the youngest wow. organization. I'm the oldest, I'm the elder, I'm the kupuna in the group, <laughs> but I'm all the, our organization is the youngest in this mm -hmm. collective, and I've learned so much from them. And we were looking, talking many times over the past five, six years, where's the next Carlton Turner, where's the next Maria Delian, where's the next Laurie Poirier, where's the next Vicky Holt Takamini? And we need to build that leadership really? among our communities. So starting to convene, we had our first pilot and we'll be doing this over the next three years, convening artists of color, people are at the intersection of social justice, art, and activism. So it's called Ely. Look for us, Intercultural Ely. Leadership Institute. Awesome. Okay. Uh, if right. I could respond really quickly yeah. as well. Right. And then, yeah, and then Beatrice will close this out. Okay. The, um, the, the Advancing Native Dialogues on Racial Equity uh, project that we have is um, intercultural, so um, it's not just for Alaska Natives, it's actually, the Alaska Native part is actually um, the insertion of indigenous values framework to have a conversation about race in a healing way. Um, and so we actually have trained um, our hosts from all kinds of different backgrounds um, and, and allowing it to spread out into the communities as opposed to it just being you know one section at a time. Oh, there you go. There it is. Okay. Um, thank you. No, this this panel has really been inspiring, and I think that you know, I was as I was listening, for example, to what you were saying, Eleanor, about um, you know giving us all these quotes. I was thinking also about all the different spaces in which I interact, and how there are different issues that um, are always excluded or that are difficult to include, and how we need to be breaking ground. Um, and having those difficult conversations because um, also I come from a Central American community where a lot of people um, who, ca who migrated to the United States, especially from El Salvador and Guatemala, were organized around um, the revolution in El Salvador and were escaping a militaristic government that was killing us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, I came and I was so young that I, I didn't belong to any organization. And also I was an artist which was my shortcoming because for them being an artist is being bourgeois so mm. you know so there's that too that you have to convince people sometimes that the art the arts are also a way of thinking visually and thinking in other ways with other languages and that it's really important for our, us as human beings to be able to produce art and to have um, that as a legacy for future generations, et cetera. And then you have other, other issues like diversity. For example, I, I work with indigenous communities. And so when I, when I work with um, other groups in, in the Central American community, then indigenous people in Central America become invisible. And then, mm -hmm. so how do you um, move from being the excluded one in front of a, um, a white racist community to being the race part of the racist community that's excluding indigenous people and w what kind of schizophrenic reality is that you know and so I think that there's something really important that is to to do that what you're doing in all the spaces where we are because we can continue to learn so much from just being careful about how we're not accepting things that sound natural just because they are what people have said before. Yeah. yeah. 
Great. Well, we, we're thank actually we're, we're out of time because we have to wrap up at 5 o'clock. Um, thank you to our wonderful panel. And thank you, everyone. And I'm going to invite uh, Roberta to close us out. Huge population. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Don't go far now, you. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, we're going to um, be passing out some evaluations. And if you could please fill out the evaluation. And I think for those who uh, had to leave early, we'll follow it up also online. But Ever the um, cultural impresario, you fill out this evaluation, you're entered into a drawing to win two tickets to Bone Hill <laughs> at Under the Radar Festival in January, one of the hottest tickets that will be in town. So if you don't live here, feel free to gift them because the holidays are coming. If you win, it's going to be an incredible gift. Um, and while we're in the mode of, of appreciation, I very much want to thank the Ford Foundation staff, particularly from the Office of Communications and the Building Operations and technical people. Our colleagues have done a tremendous job of being so supportive. And I also realized this morning that when I was naming our funders that I failed I mean, you know, you, it's like after you sit down, like two seconds, it was like, oh my God, I didn't mention Mellon and Susan Fader. And it's probably because I'm still blocked from having to write that theory of change. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that was like so hard and our entire core partner team worked on it. And I never made anyone write one of those when I worked here, but I did have to write for our president. <laughs> But honestly, Susan, it was a, an experience that really helped us to articulate our work and think through our work and to oper operationalize our work. And now we have it. If anybody else asks, we already did it. Um, but we want to thank um, our funders because when you think about what we were doing, it was something that was extraordinary. And it did not fit in the categories of funding of most people's programs anywhere. And so, you know, for us to get funding from the Mellon Foundation because of their incredible imprimatur in the arts, you know, this is like legitimate arts funder recognizes this work. And then to have Rasmussen join in and realize that on a regional level in Alaska that this was important in different states. And then to have Silicon Valley Community Foundation, to have a community foundation but that was also dealing with really smart people in the technology um, kind of capital was very, very meaningful. And then finally to have Unbound Philanthropy come on, a very leading social justice foundation working on immigration. To us, that was the mix that really represented what this project is about. So I want to thank you. Um, so, you know, I'm supposed to do a wrap up and I, get, I just honestly think, you know, I, I don't want to wrap up. I think we unwrapped, right? So much learning and, you know, that I'm still absorbing and people have been commenting about not only the unexpected conversations and the new people that they've met, but, you know, also the unexpected modalities. We tried to create different types of situations of people coming together. So your evaluations are really important to us, and what's most important to us are your suggestions. Who should be in this conversation? Who do we not know about? Um, you know, what kinds of ideas should we still be exploring? Um, you know, this is five years, and this is just the beginning. Um, so one thing I want to say, I wrote down courage and joy. I guess I, you know, I felt like a few times I was very, almost moved to tears, Ty, um, other people who presented, but the courage that it takes for us to do this work. Um, you know, th there are so many courageous people, Eleanor and others in this room. And then I think the joy. I mean, this has been a very joyous day and a very renewing day. And I think that's what it needs to be about because just the like the, you know,
complaining or whatever. I'm not into that. I'm very much into the building of our spirit. Um, so I think the, the other thing I wanted to say is that we actually had an announcement that we held off on making till today, which is that we have, um, it's like the Beatles or whatever, but we have a 15th partner officially, and I want to welcome Jose Antonio Vargas and Define American. <laughs> One quick thing, and I've already said it to Roberto on the phone last week, but I'm just gonna say it now. So, having done some Tea Party events and going to a lot of Republican conservative areas, um, given where the mainstream media is, given where our politics are, given where the conversation is, I cannot think of a more important time and a more critical time for this to happen. And in many ways, I think artists, <laughs> I think it's we're the only people who are gonna get a chance to create the narrative and to change it and to build these economic, you know, economies of empathy. Um, one last thing, since Roberta, you know, was the um, the last director to work with James Baldwin. What is that? Blues from Mr. Charlie, right? What is that great quote from Baldwin? Artists are here to disrupt the peace. So let us do that. And we cannot be prouder of Define American to be in partnership with you, Roberta. I'm going to learn so much from you. It's going to be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So I think part of the work we need to do is always to look at who's not in the room. And you know, as we thought about this gathering and this launch, we were so appreciat appreciative of Darren Walker and the Ford Foundation for offering to give us this platform. It's a very prestigious platform. You know, I think speaking from here will reach a lot of people. But we were also very aware that who's not in the room is that generation that we are talking about, the future of America. And that, you know, again, due to the limitations of space, et cetera, that young people wouldn't be here. Um, we also thought that it's important that it not just be a fixed meeting, like, and yeah, I'll see you next year at Art Change Us. Um, you know, that we would have to be responsive and think about where should we go and why. So, as I said before, we plan to do a series of five of these kinds of gatherings. They will all be different, um, and they will all be in different places. So the next one, we thought if we did New York, we would go to California. And then, given the two coasts, we would be able to entice people perhaps to go other places, to the border, to Detroit, to rural America, perhaps to Pine Ridge, Lori. Um, you know, we have many <laughs> dreams. Um, so again, knowing that youth would not be able to participate at, the, at any type of level, that was what we had uh, envisioned. <laughs> the decision was made that we should partner with our core partner, Youth Speaks, and our core partners at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Culture Strike, and the Stanford Institute with Jeff Chang. So I'm going to turn it over to them to talk about What's next? Hi. Hi, so I'm James. Hi, I'm Chinaka. I'm Jeff. And I'm Fabiana. <laughs> and we're not the Beatles. <laughs> 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 yeah, you first. All right, so hi, welcome. So um, we would like to invite everybody and everyone you know to join us in San Francisco. We're gonna have a series of activities between April 13th to April 16th, um, starting with some work down on Stanford's campus that Jeff will talk about in a second, to some collaborative programming with Culture Strike, Yerba Buena, and Youth Speaks. Um, one of the things that we think is really important is the, celebrating the celebration of the next generation of leadership. I, I founded the organization I run, Youth Speaks, when I was in my mid-20s. Um, and it was really generational. And I remember meeting first Jeff Chang and what he was talking about. I think that I represented at that time my generation, which was defined in many ways as sort of a hip hop generation or hip hop aesthetics, but I think even more so for the pertinence of the conversation that was just happening, many of us reflected coming from large, public, diverse, integrated school systems. Um, back then, when school systems were still integrated, as we know, they've become resegregated in, in many ways. I mean, that informed a lot of our practice, but what also informed a lot of our practice was the economy. So even though it was post 80s, post Ronald Reagan, et cetera, et cetera. I was living in the city of San Francisco, which is an anomaly, I admit, but I was living in a studio apartment paying $500 a month when I started the nonprofit organization that I now run. That same apartment 
now honestly goes for $2,300. So when we've recently gathered young artists and young arts leaders, they've made very clear to us that they can't do what we did, much less earlier generations who were able to sort of live much less expensively in urban and, and other environments. They quite literally can't afford to do what we did as part of the cultural movement. And they're not going to stop making art. They just might start stop making art in the nonprofit climate. And whether or not we want to allow that to happen, it's indicative upon us to give them the space to define for us what kind of world they need to be most effective, most impactful, and what does it really mean, their generational time and space, and what does that really mean? So we're going to explore that. It happens to be, and I'm going to turn it over in one second to Chinaka Hodge, who is not only the um, Associate Director of Pedagogy and Programming at Yerba <laughs> but is also an alumni of You Speaks, and we met when she was 14 years old. Um, we're going to be celebrating the 20th anniversary of You Speaks by doing the 20th You Speaks Teen Poetry Slam at Davies Symphony Hall in San Francisco. And Chinaka and I are working to bring together alumni from all across the country, including David Diggs, who's starring right now on Broadway in Hamilton, um, to really start not only highlight the future artists and leaders, but also talk through what are the different stages of that young people who were artists and found the power of art when they were teenagers, how they've been able to live in the arts or not moving forward. Thanks, James. Hi, I'm Chinaka. I'm the new Associate Director for Program and Pedagogy at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Yeah! It's a full mouthful. <laughs> and um, Roberta asked us to talk about a couple takeaways we have from today. And the thing that I heard overwhelmingly um, throughout the course of the day is that we as a group are interested in shifting public perception and then changing policy, which I think is perfect because that's what I'm charged to do in my new role at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, is create programs and pathways for our communities to be involved um, in questioning, in introspection, in investigation, and then um, changing and shifting policy. So I invite you to come out to California, see how we do it on the West Coast, and watch how art changes us. Um. So one of the things that we're really inspired by at the Stanford Institute for Diversity and the Arts is the work that both You Speaks and Yerba Buena Center have been doing around developing this idea, this notion of creative ecosystems. Um, and so what we've tried to do at Stanford is to somewhat in, in, in some ways kind of model that and also to build out um, a, a place for people, people to have discussions uh, and to talk some of these ideas through, to incubate, to make mistakes, and to, to kind of come together around ideas that do work. Um, and so on April, eight, uh, April 13th, excuse me, we'll be uh, having one of those discussions as part of um, a, a bunch of different events that'll be happening in that week around Art Change Us, uh, in which we'll be exploring some ideas, how to think about how we move into uh, the futures that we've been talking about um, and how we build, how we begin to build these creative ecosystems. So please join us for that. Yes. And uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, is um, it in uh, in uh, at Culture Strike, we're really trying to f look at how to build narratives of joy and resilience given mass incarceration and mass deportation. So we're going to continue that. We're kicking it off here at the National uh, Immigrant Integration Conference, a caucus on the intersection of mass incarceration and family detention, and then extending that. So join us uh, and let's really break the walls that are dividing so many of our people. Sorry, just to clarify the date, because I'm not going to use the mic. Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, so the big, so the okay, so April 13th is we're going to start kicking off activities. We'll have them all the through. Roberta wanted us to name one specific day. So April 16th, during the day, Yerba Buena will host a series of forum that we'll all curate together. And then that night at Davies Symphony Hall, you can experience the best spoken word that you'll ever see and you'll leave <laughs> tearful and joyful all at the same time. It'll be really yeah. incredible. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I actually, I fought, the po I fought the poetry snap for like 20 years and I lost, so I've given up on that. But I also want to just say, uh, first of all, we really, you know, April is beautiful in San Francisco. Hopefully we'll be post drought then. So you guys come, please, please spend some time with us in the Bay Area um, and the richness of it. But I just want to say to Roberta, um, very specifically, because I think we're the last ones talking today. Um, I was part of the Future Aesthetic Cohort, as oh. was all of us, um, as were some other people in the room, and many of us have gotten to know each other really well over the years. And Roberta did something that I know has impacted all of us in the work that we do. Jeff referenced it this morning when he talked about the spirit of generosity, um, but also challenge. And I remember, and some of you have heard me tell this story before, but I remember very specifically one of the first meetings after Roberta had opened the door for us, and we all thought great about ourselves. Wow, we're getting national funding from the Ford Foundation. Woo! Right? We were high. We were the Hip Hop Theater Festival. We were this. We were that. 
And Roberta called us all in together. And it was us, and Jeff, and Faviana, and Rennie Harris, and Hip Hop Theater Festival, and et cetera, et cetera. And one by one, challenged us and told us what we'd been doing wrong since she'd opened the door for us. And her basic message was, you are nothing special without the people that you're opening the door for. And if you guys mess up right now, I, Roberta, can't do what I'm trying to do now that I'm here at the Ford Foundation. So your responsibility is beyond yourself. Your responsibility is for all the doors you're either opening or shutting for everybody else. And that work has really translated, I think, into all of our work. And as we look at the future, and as we, all of us, all th four of us, work with younger people than we are, and try and really open up doors and space for them, we carry with the message that Roberta gave us, and the challenge for us to be who we could possibly be if we thought beyond just ourselves in this moment. So Roberta, thank Thanks. you for all that. <laughs>